Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show, and today is October 15th, and today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 5.16. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so. So let's look now at our text today, Deuteronomy 5.16. And Deuteronomy 5.16 says this, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Well, this is our reading today from Deuteronomy 5.16. Jesus said that the law and the prophets depend on two commands, loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourself in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. The first four commands of the Decalogue have to do with loving God, and the rest have to do with loving our neighbor. The sequence in which the commands are given represents the two priorities of Christian behavior. It begins on the vertical plane with our relationship with God, and it flows onto the horizontal plane to our relationship with people and things here on earth. We cannot have one without the other. And it's significant that this most basic statement about human relationships should begin with a relationship within the family unit. As the old saying goes, charity begins at home. The fifth command states this in Deuteronomy 5.16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And so the command is cited several times in the New Testament in Matthew 15, Mark 7, Mark 10, Luke 18, Ephesians 6, and Colossians 3. Another list of miscellaneous laws in Leviticus 19 begins with this in Leviticus 19, 2-3. You shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Many Jewish writers believed that honoring one's parents was the most important commandment. And the important place given to honoring parents in the Word of God, it suggests that this practice is a basic ingredient to a healthy society. When children do not respect their parents, something is seriously wrong. So Paul stipulates in 1 Timothy 3, 4, that an overseer must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Dignified submission of children to parents is a key to a healthy Christian home. The absence of this is very serious. Later, Moses says in Deuteronomy 27, 16, Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. So why is honoring parents so vital? Submission and honor are an important part of a liberated life. One of the basic results of the fall, which Paul describes as not seeing fit to acknowledge God, is children being disobedient to parents in Romans 1, 28-30. And one of the best ways to describe the rebellion against God that lies at the heart of the fall is that people do not honor him as as God or give thanks to him in Romans 1.21. So human relationships are intended to mirror our relationship with God. And so Paul tells wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord in Ephesians 5.22. He tells slaves in Ephesians 6.5, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Similar, we relate to our earthly fathers with respect and love, just as we must relate to our heavenly father with respect and love. And so if we fail to do that, we perpetuate the attitude that lies at the heart of the most serious defect in fallen humanity, the refusal to honor God. 
Now, godly people then are skilled in showing honor. So in the church life, we are to outdo one another in showing honor in Romans 12, 10. In social life, we are to pay uh, to all what is owed to them, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed, as in Romans 13, 7. Slaves are to honor their masters in 1 Timothy 6, 1. Husbands are to honor their wives in 1 Peter 3, 7. Christians honor national rulers in 1 Peter 2, 17. And it's especially important to honor those who are older than we are. Leviticus 19, 32 places respect for elders alongside fearing the Lord. When it says, you shall stand up uh, before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. And you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Parents also need to act in a way that makes them worthy of honor. They need to earn respect through teaching their children, and they must not abuse their authority. Ephesians 6.4, Paul says this to fathers. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so the Old Testament often talks about the responsibility of parents teaching their children and disciplining them. And when parents fail in these duties, their children find it difficult to honor them. This in turn results in stunted personality that is reluctant to give honor to humans or to God. Now, in the ancient Near East, the family was the basic unit of society. And if the family was attacked, the whole fabric of society was in danger of disintegrating. Today, too, for several reasons, the family is under fire. Therefore, this command should receive new prominence in contemporary Christian thinking. I want to highlight two huge challenges facing the church. One has become urgent, especially in influent, the affluent West and the other in poorer countries. The first challenge we are facing is that there has been a revolt against the idea of respecting authority and elders especially, but not exclusively in the West. Philip Ryken refers to an analysis of the 1960s by Annie Godeb, who, which she describes as the generation that destroyed the American family. And she writes this, We might not have been able to tear down the state, but the family was closer. We could get our hands on it. And she goes on saying, We believe that the family was the foundation of the state as well as the collective state of mind. We truly believe that the family had to be torn apart to free love, which could heal the damage done when the atom was split to release energy. And the first step was to tear ourselves free from our parents. Perhaps the older generation was partly to blame for this dismantling of the fabric of society. Perhaps the reaction of the 60s was a reaction to some wrong attitudes of the earlier generation, such as conservatism that had no heart and had little interest in the aspirations of the poor and the oppressed. Those who are in the so-called two-thirds world can identify with the protests against unilateral decisions and even the initiatives by richer countries that have a major impact on the poor nations and against things like the idea of western superiority but what they replace this with seems to be worse and the thing against which they protested today people are reluctant to stick to relationships that they think are threats to their freedom and to do whatever they want to do and so commitment is so yesterday the loss of faith in the value of objective truth has resulted in people finding it difficult to stomach the applying of the binding principles that determine faith in action. In this environment, biblical preaching and exhortation has truly gone out of fashion. Ways of disciplining children, which were normal in biblical times, are regarded today as abusive treatment of children. In such an environment, we should not be surprised that people are finding it difficult to obey and even honor their parents and to express that honor and costly commitment to their welfare. People do not act with this type of commitment because they feel like doing it. Often, especially with elderly parents, they may not feel like doing it. They do these things because they believe that this is the right thing to do. Of course, at the heart of such a commitment is love too. And yet, humans cannot violate the biblical lifestyle and expect to experience the freedom that they seek. 
Their quest for liberation or personal fulfillment only serves to enslave them to the shackles of unfulfillment. We were made in the image of a God who is a person and whose character is holy love. God's holiness calls for respect and his love and the fact that he is a person and invites us to intimacy. The biblical ideal of parenthood, its pattern after our relationship with God as our father. It is characterized by the beautiful mingling of respect with intimacy and self-sacrificial concern. That is the relationship that truly satisfies the, the deep yearning of our hearts. We were made to honor and respect what is exalted and to relish intimacy with and sacrifice for loving persons. The perfection of such a relationship can be achieved only with God, but the relationship with godly parents can be a fitting shadow of that. May God help Christians to restore this model. Now, another serious threat to the biblical model of parent-child relationships is the neglect of children, especially because of vocational ambition of parents. This is seen in affluent circles when parents are so busy in their professions that their children are neglected. But the extreme form is seen in poorer nations where, in a desperate attempt to free a family from the grinding poverty they face, parents, especially mothers, leave home to work abroad. In several poor countries today, millions of children's mothers have decided to go abroad to work because they believe they could find no other way to free their families from hopeless poverty. Many such children lacking the security of alert supervision by loving and firm parents have adopted destructive lifestyles. Many even end up enslaved to drugs or pornography, and some children drop out of school and become delinquents. And yet, I must give a word of encouragement to children whose parents have not had time for them. Indeed, they may be deprived in some ways and may have to struggle with the scars of that neglect as long as they even live. But God's grace can help them overcome these obstacles so they can become useful people in our society and even godly people. Gaius Davies, a leading psychiatrist in London, has written a book titled Genius, Grief, and Grace, in which he shows that some of the greatest heroes in Christian history were are people who had psychological deficiencies but were nonetheless used mightily because of the grace of God. One such person was Anthony Ashley Cooper, better known as the Earl of Shaftesbury, who achieved much in the political sphere on behalf of the poor, the weak, abused children, and the insane. He was also active in several evangelical causes. His parents were wealthy and influential socialites who had little time for their son. But the maid who looked after him led him to Christ and was the person whom he considered to be the closest friend he ever had. Even as an adult, he was often depressed and was sometimes even difficult to get along with, but he achieved an enormous amount of good for the kingdom of God. I, we have all seen people become effective leaders in spite of having come from dysfunctional family backgrounds. They have not let their deprivation cause too much damage. These people were able to overcome this by accepting that they had a problem, by being teachable, and by making adjustments so their weaknesses are compensated for. They were willing to get help to work on their weaknesses and to get others to do what they still cannot do well. Often they learn the principle of affectionate respect and honor by having spiritual parents whom they could genuinely love and honor. Most importantly, they learn to respect and even relate affectionately with God through the influence of these spiritual parents. These parents help them gain a sense of self-worth that open them up to receive the much greater self-worth that God gives on account of Christ. Now, there are many ways in which parents can be honored today. The most obvious way to honor parents is by obeying them. Paul uses the fifth commandment to teach about the parent-child relationship in Ephesians 6, 2-3. But before quoting this, he says this in verse 1 of Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Elsewhere, Paul says in Colossians 3.20, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And the phrase, in everything, should perhaps be understood as referring to everything that you can do as a Christian that is not contrary to the word of God. This could be one implication of the expression, obey your parents in the Lord in the Ephesians passage. We obey as if we were obeying the Lord Jesus himself. Another implication of obeying in the Lord is that we obey our parents whether they're Christians or not. For when we obey, we do so as if we are obeying the Lord. So these two verses seem to imply that we are to obey non-Christian parents 
always unless what they say contradicts the clear teaching of Christ. Now, it's true that Jesus said that he came to bring a sword that caused division in families in Matthew 10. But that refers to situations where we have to make a choice between following Christ and obeying parents. These statements of Christ have been used in such a way as to trigger unnecessary ruptures in families and persecution that could be avoided. Now, even after a rupture takes place, we should do our utmost to restore and even be about reconciling that relationship. Samuel Ganesh was a Brahim, the highest caste in the Hindu system and a vehement opponent of Christianity. In, um, in South India, he heard the gospel and was dramatically converted to Christ the same day. His parents disowned him and even refused to have anything to do with him for several years. Ganesh then became an evangelist who communicates the gospel powerfully, especially to Hindu audiences, using his vast knowledge of the Hindu scriptures to show that what they are looking for only Christ can give. Some years after Ganesh's conversion, his father died, and in keeping with his, the customs of his people and his traditions, he began to send regular financial support to his widowed mother. She received the money but refused to establish contact with him. After six long years of this, she reached out to him. And when this happened, Ganesh expressed more, more willingness to take on responsibility for his mother's welfare. Today, she is proud of his concern for her, and a door has been opened for Christian witness to the whole family. Now, our parents may reject us because of our Christian commit commitment, but they are still our parents, and so we will honor them in the Lord. That is, if we were doing it for Jesus' sake alone, which is what we're to do. Respecting parents is another way that we can honor them. In Leviticus 19.3, it says, Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. I am the Lord your God. The Levites were asked to proclaim to the people the truth of Deuteronomy 27:16. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. Proverbs 30:17 says, "The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures." Today, children often speak rudely to their parents. That is something that is not acceptable for Christians. Indeed, at home, when we're not a acting a part, our bad moods often find expression in disrespectful talk but we must learn to be able to express our moods without hurting others and without being disrespectful it is particularly important to respect parents when they are old and so we're told this in proverbs 23 22 listen to your father who gave life and do not despise your mother when she is old often when parents are old they do things that their children find annoying sometimes they may need to be restrained through a rebuke or even some other drastic method often they need to be directed just as we direct children today but though their actions may annoy us and though we may need to be firm and in insisting on some things with them we must always do so with the respect that is due to parents now while Jesus was on the cross bearing the sins of the world and experiencing the greatest suffering that a human ever endured he asked John to look after his mother in John 19 26 to 27 no work is more important than what Jesus did to save the world, and no work we do is too important to warrant the neglect of our parents. We see this in Mark 7, 10-13, that when Jesus used the fifth command to present the responsibility to look after parents, he showed how ridiculous it is for people to claim they are giving things for God's work and in that way avoid their responsibility towards their parents. In a passage about caring for widows, Paul says this in 1 Timothy 5, 4, But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Here, caring for parents and grandparents is given as evidence of the godliness of a person. A few verses later, Paul becomes somewhat caustic and says this in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Paul says that to care for widows is to make some return to our parents in 1 Timothy 5, 4. 
As Adam Clark puts it, your parents supported and nourished you when you were young and helpless. You ought, therefore, to support them when they are old and destitute. In both cases, there is helplessness. Often, aged people behave like children. Then why is it that children don't look after aged parents with the same enthusiasm that these parents looked after them when they were children? Indeed, older parents can be quite difficult. We know that. And when they become old, they can get quite demanding and even stubborn. Sometimes their condition is such that they require a lot of care. But we need to remember infants are like that too. Perhaps one reason for the difficulties in, in the way helpless parents and helpless infants are treated is that infants were rich with potential and the parents found their identity in helping those infants reach their potential. Elderly parents do not look like people with much potential. And in our market-oriented culture, going through a lot of trouble for such people is often considered a waste of time. So often children try to see how they can avoid the nuisance associated with looking after aged parents. And yet Christians, they follow a different ethic. One of the main teachings of the great love passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 through 1 Corinthians 14, 1 is that love is not just a means to an end, it is an end in itself. For Christians, the primary motivation for loving is not the prospect of the results that love produces. It is that love is part of our lifestyle. We love because we want to love. Our reward is having the privilege of loving other people and loving our Lord first. And if we have loved, we have been successful. Parental love is part of the Christian lifestyle. So we must do it whether uh, those for whom we care are able to respond to that love or not. This kind of love is one of the most radical features of biblical Christianity. It has a lot to say to people today who are suffering from severe insecurity because the idea of costly commitment has been abandoned. Insecurity is one of the sad consequences of disposable relationships that have become so normal in our society today. People give up friends, they give up churches, they give up jobs, they give up girlfriends and boyfriends and even spouses when they become a nuisance. They do not know the security that comes at the end of serious threats to a relationship after a heavy struggle remains intact. They are afraid to give fully of themselves to a relationship because they do not know when they will have to end it. And if you do not give yourself fully to a relationship, you're not going to enjoy it either. Braced by the joy of the Lord that gives us strength to face hardship without losing our peace, we embrace suffering and pain that go with our commitments. Christians often do things that they may not necessarily like to do. They are not emotional cripples who want to do only what they do. They are skilled instead in taking up their crosses daily, as Luke 9.23 says, and in giving their bodies as a living sacrifice, as Romans 12.1 says. They know that their joy is not taken away by hardship, but that it can be taken away by disobedience. Because our primary source of fulfillment, God, is not puffed up by the pain. And because the primary expression of that fulfillment, the joy of the Lord, can coexist with pain, we are able to go on without becoming disillusioned. Now, what a contrast this life of joy is to the guilt that people live with over not caring for their loved ones and to the unhappiness that is the inevitable result of a self-centered life. So after stating the fifth commandment, Moses gives a promise of a reward for honoring parents when he says this, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Well, we must ask, how can we apply this today? I have already talked about that though the law was specifically given to Israel, it was given by God uh, whose nature does not change. Therefore, even from law specifically given to Israel, we can glean abiding principles that reflect the mind and the will of God. The reference to the land here must be clearly confined to Israel. Paul quotes this reward in Ephesians that can help us to apply this promise today. Ephesians 6.3 says that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And though the land refers to Canaan in its original context, the prospect of long life in the land is mentioned here too. But the word used could be better translated earth, in which the case for us is a promise for a long life on earth. As A. Skevington Wood points out, the prospect of longevity is not held out elsewhere in the New Testament as part of Christian hope. In fact, in the five other times it's mentioned in the New Testament that the command to honor parents appears, this 
promise of long life is not found. The New Testament promise has been interpreted in different ways. First, some take this promise of a long life as referring to the community and not the individual. Second, some think that those who honor their parents will generally literally live long. In some cases, God's providence orders otherwise. Third, some spiritualize the reference to long life and make it to refer to eternal life. But that seems unlikely as a promise is that they may live long in the land. For some think the focus should be on the phrase that it may go well with you and that Paul means that such children will live uh, to prove that their true welfare depends on God. Well, I think that the best interpretation is the fourth one. Now, what that means is what Paul is saying is that children who honor their parents will receive God's blessing. God is going to work things out for them and they will not lack for anything that they need. Just as the Israelites interpreted God's blessing in terms of a long life, we will interpret it in terms of a full life where God leads and provides for all that we need. Included here could be the second interpretation. A long life is a general rule along with exceptions that were found in the Old Testament as well. Now, whatever Whatever the exact meaning of Paul's interpretation of the blessing of keeping the fifth commandment may be, the general message is clear. God will bless those who honor their parents. The other side of this coin is also true. If we do not honor our parents, we should not expect God to bless us. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching this episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is October 15th, and we've looked at Deuteronomy 5.16. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.